Okay, good morning, everyone. It's just after 10 and uh, welcome uh, to this morning's webinar. Uh, I think we're gonna get started now. It seems to, there seem to be uh, quite a few people online. Uh, so welcome to the presentation. My name is Caitlin Broderick. I'm the Associate Director of the Financial Inclusion Program at Innovations for Poverty Action, uh, and I will help to facilitate the webinar today. Before we get started, I do want to let you know that uh, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of the session. Uh, so you can submit your all of your questions. There's a, um, a box at the bottom of the screen uh, that says Q&A. You can write all of your questions in there. We'll review them as the um, webinar continues and we'll answer as many questions as time allows for um, at the end. Uh, also to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available after the session. Uh, so we thank you for your time today and, and let's get started. So joining me today um, is the principal investigator of the research, Dr. Jeremy Burke, as well as Crystal McDuffie and Jean Elias, uh, who partnered to design the, to implement the research findings themselves. Jeremy Burke uh, is a senior economist at the University of Southern California's Center for Economic and Social Research. Crystal McDuffie is the Director of Credit Services and Compliance at Consumer Education Services, Inc. And Jean Elias is the Vice President of Marketing at Consumer Education Services, Inc. as well. So today we're gonna give you just a little bit of background on innovations for poverty action uh, for those of you that are, that are new to our organization. Uh, Jeremy will then present some of the early results on the reframing of the debt management program, uh, that debt. And Crystal and Jean will discuss how consumer education services implemented and applied the results of the study. Uh, then we'll spend some time on uh, questions and answers at the end. So, of course, we'd like to thank the Ford Foundation for their generous support. Uh, they made this research possible. This research is actually a part of a broader effort by the Ford Foundation in partnership with Innovations for Poverty Action to design and test behaviorally informed products with academics and practitioners in the United States. Uh, so Jeremy's study is one of the rigorous evaluations conducted as a part of, of this Financial Products Innovation Fund. Uh, so for those of you who aren't closely familiar with Innovations for Poverty Action, uh, IPA is a global um, nonprofit research organization. Our goal is to generate evidence about what types of interventions work, what types of interventions don't necessarily work, and how to support evidence-informed decision-making. Since our founding in 2002, IPA has worked with over 600 leading academics to conduct over 830 evaluations in 51 countries. The research has informed hundreds of successful programs uh, that now impact millions of individuals worldwide. So we partner with academics and decision makers. Those include nonprofits and governments. Together, we identify pressing issues. For example, this, uh, this research pro uh, project, which focuses on over indebtedness amongst consumers. We then identify potential solutions uh, and we evaluate those solutions to understand what works and why. Uh, to do this, we mostly use randomized control trials. And those are the same rigorous methods that are used in the medical field to assess the effectiveness of, of medicines and approaches. Uh, so now I'd like to um, send it over to Jeremy to talk about some of the results of the research. See, Jeremy, are you, are you there? There we go. Yep, thanks. Hopefully that was a relatively successful transition. Thanks, Kate. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining. It's my pleasure to start discuss some early results um, from a study that we've been fortunate to conduct. And this is joint work with my colleague, uh, Simone Shainer, uh, who's also at USC in which we're going to test a couple different strategies uh, to see uh, what's most effective in helping consumers reduce their high interest debt burdens. Uh, to do that, we collaborated, <clears throat> as Kate mentioned, with uh, Consumer Education Services, Inc., so SESI. Uh, we had great fortunate, very fortunate to do that. Um, and so SESI provides uh, a lot of services and programs to their clients, and Jean and Crystal can tell you more. But one of the principal solutions that they offer is a debt management plan. 
So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with debt management plans, or as I'll be referenced here throughout the talk, DMPs, uh, DMPs work with consumers that have lots of high interest unsecured debt. Uh, and then SESI will go through a consumer's financial life in detail uh, to work out how much they can repay towards debt each month. Uh, and they set up a one monthly payment system where clients remit payment directly to SESI and then SESI uh, redistributes those funds to clients' creditors in accordance with renegotiated agreements. Uh, so in the context of DMP, the SESI will intercede on their client's behalf to reduce interest rates uh, and reduce late fees of clients' creditors. Uh, and despite uh, the many benefits associated with participating in a DMP, uh, dropout is really high. It's just really quite difficult uh, to complete a DMP. Typically, these programs last three to five years. Uh, and clients are going to devote a, a large fraction of their monthly take-home pay specifically towards debt reduction. So it can be behaviorally difficult to continue in one of these programs. So certainly, uh, some of this dropout is driven by negative financial shocks. For example, if someone loses a job and has no income, uh, there's really no way they can make debt payments uh, and no behavioral intervention is going to overcome shocks like that. Um, but we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that, that much or at least part of this dropout is driven by behavioral factors, often a lack of motivation or people don't want to stick with the really aggressive repayment schedule, uh, devoting a large fraction of their take home pay for three to five years. It can be hard to, uh, to keep that motivation month over month. So there's a, a variety of ways we might try to help increase motivation and improve success rates uh, and client debt reduction outcomes in the context of a DMP. Uh, first, we can try to use financial incentives, essentially to pay people uh, to improve the financial behavior. And, and sometimes that works, sometimes that can increase motivation, uh, but invariably these solutions are costly to implement. Other approaches uh, that try to leverage uh, psychology uh, like the debt snowball, where consumers will try to pay down their smallest debt balance first and try to create some quick wins, uh, may be uh, effective in improving perceptional progress towards goal. Uh, there's some anecdotal evidence that suggests it might be the case. Uh, but they're often financially inefficient. So if your smallest debt burden is not also your highest interest burden, then putting money towards that first uh, is going to provide less of a payoff than when if you were to put that money towards the, the debt that has the, the highest interest rate. So in this, in this project, we're going to test a couple of uh, behaviorally informed approaches uh, that are really low cost and see if they can help improve uh, DMP client outcomes, particularly whether they can help consumers more effectively reduce their high interest debt uh, and whether they can increase uh, consumer retention uh, and outcomes on the SESI side. So there's been uh, some observational and uh, evidence from lab studies uh, that have found that uh, consumers find it uh, quite uh, motivating uh, if their large debt burdens are broken down to more manageable sub-goals uh, and can increase perception of progress towards goal and uh, hopefully improve completion by breaking down these, this large singular goal into a series of small but steadily increasing sub-goals to create some quick wins and try to increase perception of progress towards goal. Uh, the second strategy we're going to try is uh, simple encouragements. Uh, often consumers get little feedback in the debt reduction process and perhaps a simple pat on the back might help improve uh, perception of progress and motivation to stay on their DMP. Uh, and there's some mixed evidence on the efficacy of encouragements and financial behavior uh, but importantly, for both the, the, the debt reframing or uh, smart debt snowball methodology, there's essentially no evidence uh, from rigorous field ex experiments on whether this might work, uh, and very little evidence uh, in the context of debt repayment, whether simple encouragements uh, might be effective. So our hypothesis was that this would be, uh, these types of behavior interventions would be most effective early in the life cycle of DMP, so just when consumers are starting to make the lifestyle changes required to be successful in the context of devoting large fractions of their take home pay towards debt reduction. Uh, so that's the population we're gonna focus on uh, in today's talk. These are gonna be consumers who are newly starting a DMP 
uh, and some of them are going to get uh, one of these two interventions, which I'll talk about uh, in more detail. Okay, so the way we're going to test these strategies, as Kate uh, mentioned, is we're going to use a randomized control trial. In particular, as consumers sign up uh, for a debt management plan with SESI, they're going to be randomized into one of three groups. Uh, the first group is going to be a control group, and they're going to get the status quo, which is just SESI's DMP as it normally exists, all the regular services and benefits uh, entailed therein. The second group uh, is going to get the status quo plus uh, some encouragement messaging. So at six touch points uh, in the DMP lifecycle, they're gonna get some messages, essentially patting them on the back and helping them realize the progress they've made towards their debt reduction goals. Uh, and the second uh, treatment group, so our third study group, uh, is going to get a reframing treatment where we're going to uh, create some external reference points by breaking down their, their large a singular debt reduction goal into a series of steadily increasing, starting small and getting larger over time uh, milestones and try to have them track progress towards debt reduction against these milestones. And we're going to track how these two interventions affect uh, outcomes within the context of debt management plan, particularly uh, on time payment rates, uh, client retention uh, uh, metrics, and overall amount of debt repaid on the DMP to see if either or both of these interventions might help improve outcomes relative to the status quo. All right, so who is in our, our sample? So in total, we have a little over 4,200 uh, clients who signed up for a debt management plan at SESI uh, between February uh, and January, February of last year and January of this year. Uh, and on average, or really our population is quite representative of the DMP clientele as a whole. So average age is about 43 years old, uh, about two thirds of our sample is female, uh, about 30% are married. Uh, there's a fair amount of missingness in uh, people responding to their race or ethnicity, uh, but among those who responded, a little bit more than half are white, 20% uh, uh, black and 17% uh, Hispanic. Uh, some missingness on uh, educational outcomes, uh, but about 80% have a high school degree or less, and 20% have a college degree or more. Uh, importantly for our study, uh, almost everyone uh, in SESI's program opts into SMS messages, uh, which we're going to uh, use to uh, keep clients and treatment groups uh, abreast of their progress using the various interventions. Uh, and only about less than 1% opt out of email. So clients are gonna get both SMS messages and emails. Uh, and so very, very few clients uh, are not gonna get either one of these uh, types of uh, messages. So in terms of their financial life, uh, as we'd expect, these are consumers that are really struggling with lots of high interest unsecured debt. So at the start, uh, on average, consumers are gonna have more than $9,000 in high interest debt on their DMP. Uh, the bulk of which is coming from credit card debt. Okay. And they're going to uh, be devoting uh, more than $300 on average towards uh, debt reduction each month, uh, which is a large fraction of their monthly take-home pay. So when we, when we combine the, the new uh, DMP uh, payment with their existing monthly expenses, clients are going to have very, very little slack in their budget. Okay. So less than $100 on average in monthly disposable income after we tack on this, this large uh, DMP monthly payment. All right. uh, there's also uh, quite a bit of evidence of difficulty repaying debts in the past. Uh, on average, clients have about 50, or sorry, five uh, delinquent incidents uh, on their credit report, 30-day delinquencies uh, in the past few years, uh, and some evidence of serious delinquencies as well, about three incidents in which there are 90 or more days late on their on their uh, credit obligations. So that was really a lot of numbers to throw at you quite quickly, but there's two things I want you to take away from these two slides. Is, is one is that our sample is really representative of DMP borrowers as a whole. And second, if you look across the three columns, the control, the encouragement, and their framing, you'll notice that essentially there's no meaningful differences on any of these dimensions across the, the three groups. Uh, which is excellent. So 
So this suggests that our randomization worked as we envisioned, uh, and there's no observable differences uh, across the, the three groups, uh, which helps improve our statistical precision uh, and also helps improve our uh, uh, really our strategy that any differences we observe between the groups going forward is going to be due to the uh, treatment group that they were assigned to. Uh, there's no differences between the groups otherwise. And so that all the effects we see from the encouragement or framing uh, can be interpreted as causal effects. Great, so what, what did the interventions look like? So both consumers in the encouragement group and the reframing group uh, are going to get the DMP uh, as those in the control group, but they're going to get these additional messaging interventions. We created uh, six touch points where both the encouragement group and the reframing group are going to get additional messages. Particularly, they're going to get uh, another message at enrollment describing uh, the future messaging schedule. Uh, and then they're going to get another message after they've paid 3% of their debt, 8% of their debt, 24% of their debt, 60% uh, of their debt, and then at completion. Okay. Uh, and so we've also, for the reframing group, we've structured these uh, message points to correspond to the milestones that they're, they're going to try to track progress against. Okay. So the first milestone is at 3%, second milestone is at 8% of debt, and so forth. And we uh, specifically created these milestones to start small and increase over time. Uh, and depending upon the length of a client's uh, debt management plan at the start, uh, all clients are going to complete month uh, milestone one and milestone two within the first six months if they pay as agreed. Uh, and most clients will compete three out of the five milestones uh, in the first year within the context of the DMP. So hopefully this will create some perception of progress towards goal where they're curing some really quick wins early in the life cycle of the DMP, and this may help improve motivation to complete overall. So in addition to these uh, six touch points for messaging, we're also going to uh, create some visuals that I'll show you in a second uh, and embed these visuals both in the monthly statements that clients receive uh, and embed these visuals uh, on their homepage that they see every time they log into their uh, SESI portal. So here are some examples of uh, the messages uh, at initiation that consumers in both the encouragement group and the framing group receive. Uh, so the larger box is uh, the email example, uh, and the smaller box is essentially how it would look in text message format. Uh, so for both the, the encouragement and the framing group at the outset, uh, they got this notice telling them that they're going to hear more from SESI as they make progress on paying down their DMP. Uh, the encouragement group said, emails and messages said little more than that. And uh, the reframing group also noted that we've created five milestones to help them track their progress. And that these milestones are worth noting and celebrating. So look out for communications from SESI when you reach one of these milestones. So here's some examples of uh, emails and text messages consumers would get after they triggered uh, one of the milestone events, so after they paid off 3%, 8%, 24% of their debt, uh, et cetera. Uh, so the encouragement group, all it was essentially just a pat on the back. Okay, so we congratulated them for, for making it this far, uh, for paying off X dollars in their DMP, keep up the good work. Uh, for those in the, the reframing group, we explicitly track progress against the milestone. So we say congratulations, you completed your second of five milestones, or you completed here your fourth, your fifth milestones, only one left to go. Uh, click on the SESI site to, to find out more about how uh, much progress you're making in repaying your debt. All right, so here are uh, the visuals uh, that we created as well. So on the top, you'll see the encouragement group visual, uh, which is really tracking progress uh, entirely against their overall uh, DMP starting balance. Okay, which is a slider here that would move from the left to the right uh, as they paid off more and more of their debt uh, until they completely got out of debt. Uh, and in their framing group, and we track progress specifically against those those five milestones, uh, which were started small but then steadily increased throughout the life cycle of the DMP. 
So we embedded these images both on the website, which they would see as they logged in, uh, and we also embedded them in their monthly statements. Uh, and these, on the website, these images would, would change dynamically over time as consumers made more progress in paying their debt. Uh, and on the, on the statement, we took a, month shot, a snapshot at month end of where they were in their uh, DMP repayment life cycle. Okay, great. So what happened? Uh, so first, I'll look at uh, outcomes from the encouragement messaging, and then I'll look at uh, effects from the uh, reframing treatment. Uh, so we see actually some, uh, some encouraging effects, positive effects from the encouragement messaging. Uh, in particular, consumers who are randomized into the encouragement messaging treatment uh, were 1.4 percentage points more likely to pay on time uh, each month, uh, about 2% uh, less likely to drop out of the DMP, uh, and conversely, about 2% more likely to uh, keep their account active. So the difference between dropout and active is some people uh, completed their DMP successfully uh, during uh, the life during our study, uh, and so there are some positive effects there, but we can't detect any statistical differences uh, on that dimension. Uh, so correspondingly, consumers are also uh, paying off more of their debt, particularly $40 uh, per month on average. So for both of these effects, all these effects on uh, retention, paying on time, and uh, debt repaid, uh, this is effect averaged across all of the months we have uh, data for, uh, which is about uh, 10 months so far. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is we can also look at how these effects appear to be growing over time to see whether there's some indication that effects might grow as we have more data. Uh, and we see that exactly appears to be the case. So here, um, we're tracking dropout on the, the vertical axis against months in the program on the horizontal axis. And we see that in the first few months of the DMP, uh, there's essentially no difference between our encouragement uh, group and our, our control group. Uh, the effects of the treatment are small and not statistically significant. Uh, but then starting in about month six, uh, they really start to diverge. Uh, and by uh, month 10 of the program, we're seeing pretty large differences between the encouragement group and the control group. Namely, by month 10 of the encouragement group treatment, uh, clients in the encouragement group are six percentage points less likely to drop out than those in the control group. Uh, and this is a large effect. Right? So consumers in the control group are dropping out at a rate of about 37%. Uh, so this six percentage point reduction in dropout is about a 17% reduction in, uh, in client dropout, which is, which is really large, uh, especially for uh, an intervention that essentially has a zero marginal cost. Um, one thing to point out here, uh, which I should have said at the outset, is this is all, all preliminary. And you'll notice uh, for the researchers in the audience that our, our uh, estimates are uh, not very precise here. Our confidence intervals are quite large. Uh, so we're tracking what's going to go going on over time. And as we get more data, our estimates will get more and more precise. But the, the uh, existing evidence, the preliminary evidence, is really, is really kind of encouraging. We're seeing some some stark patterns that uh, this appears to have some, some effects and it appears that these effects are growing over time. All right, so here's the, the converse story looking at uh, uh, clients maintaining an active account within the DMP and the story is just the same, right? So this is the, the flip side of dropout. Uh, here the differences between dropout and active are due to clients who successfully completed the program. So we see a small bump and clients successfully completing in the first 10 months uh, as well. Uh, but that effect is not detectable. Uh, but more importantly, we see very similar effects in the amount of debt repaid, okay, where effects are very small and not significant through the first few months of the DMP. Uh, but it appears that effects are growing over time. Uh, and as the intervention runs longer, we may see larger effects on uh, debt reduction outcomes, which is, which is really encouraging. So when I saw this, uh, I was really excited because I thought the, the, encourage, the reframing treatment was going to work like gangbusters since there's more evidence that that appears to be effective in the lab and correlational evidence suggesting that it might be successful. Uh, but in fact, the reverse is true. Uh, we saw essentially no effects whatsoever from the uh, reframing or milestone treatment 
uh, all of our, our estimates are uh, really close to zero uh, and none are statistically significant. Uh, so here's the effect averaged across all months on, on time repayment rates, dropouts, and uh, keeping an account active. And similarly, we see, we see no effect on uh, debt repaid. And in fact, the, the point estimate is, is negative. Uh, and we also see no clear pattern that effects are going to change over time. Uh, so here is a chart showing dropout uh, as a function of programmatic month. Uh, and you see that the estimate is really just jumping around, uh, sometimes above, sometimes below zero, but always small and not statistically significant. Uh, and the same is true uh, for all the measures uh, that we're interested in, uh, account activity uh, and amount of debt repaid. Point estimates are always small and not statistically significant. So uh, to sum up some of our, our preliminary insights, which really uh, I want to underscore that uh, our study is ongoing. We're still collecting data, and so things may change over time. Uh, but what we're seeing now at about the one-year mark into the study is really some positive uh, effects from the encouragement uh, treatment, where we're just giving some people pats on the back at strategic, strategically selected points in the DNP lifecycle. Uh, on average, across all months, we're seeing this increase uh, on time repayment rates. Uh, but at relatively modest 1.4 percentage points, uh, increasing, reducing uh, programmatic dropout uh, by a little bit more than two percentage points on average across all months, uh, and increasing uh, debt repaid. Uh, so on average, uh, in the average month, clients are paying $40 more, each client in the treatment group is paying $40 more than those in the control, uh, which is quite sizable uh, when multiplied up across months uh, and by clients. Uh, but more importantly, we appear that these effects are, are growing over time uh, and becoming quite sizable. Uh, though again, I should note that the estimates, uh, the monthly effects are, are still rather imprecise uh, as we don't have a ton of people uh, in the later months of the study yet, since it's only been going on for about a year. Uh, in contrast, uh, we see no observable effects whatsoever uh, from the reframing treatments from the milestone treatment. Uh, and our, our effects are precise enough to, to rule out uh, pretty modest size effects. Uh, and we see no evidence that these effects are going to get better over time. Uh, effects appear to be stable uh, and bouncing around zero month over month. Uh, so despite what we've seen in the past, uh, when once taken to the field, it doesn't look like uh, this milestone or sub-goal reframing uh, might be that effective in helping consumers reduce their debt. Uh, so I will, I will conclude there uh, and turn it back over to Kate. Uh, and looking forward to answering any questions uh, that the group has. Great. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Terrific. Um, so actually, I think it's. Um, on to uh, Christy and Jean. Okay, great. Um, this is Crystal um, from Consumer Education Services. And um, I think we want to talk a little bit about um, our experience with this research project. Um, first and foremost, we, as Jeremy mentioned, one of the biggest challenges that we had within our organization and the industry was client retention. I mean, as he mentioned, we had clients that um, we do still in some instances have clients who drop off considerably early in the debt management program. Um, in most cases, the program lasts about um, 60 months, and we find that consumers who actually are able to make at least three consecutive payments tend to stay longer. So we were trying to find a way to keep the clients in the first three months motivated, which led us to um, reach out to the Institute of Money Management um, and we came up with a machine learning project where um, the machine learning project led us to meet Jeremy. Um, the machine learning project um, cost us money as far as implementation, software applications, and to be honest, at this particular point, we cannot say that we have had much um, success as far as improving retention in the first couple of months. But um, the reframing project um, actually 
and encouragement messaging, something small and simple um, did not cost us anything. We were very pleased to see the impact as far as improving that retention rate. Um, we did have a few challenges at first with, with the implementation as far as, I think you mentioned the debt reframing project. Um, in some instances, clients were a little confused about the percentage points, but the encouragement messaging seemed to go over so well that we've actually decided that we're going to implement this across the board with our entire client base. Um, we did find this to be a, a value at collaborating with an outside um, researcher because we have tried um, in several instances to do our own analysis and research um, concerning client retention. And the challenge is when you have worked in the industry, um, for example, myself, I've been here maybe 15, 16 years. Um, you tend to have biases, um, you make assumptions. So reaching out to um, an outside agency, a research agency gave us a fresh, fresh perspective on um, looking at this problem and looking at a different approach. Um, also being able to do a test design in a more structured environment. Um, we are experts in the debt management field, but definitely not in the research field. So um, we had several challenges when we tried to do this on our own as far as data interpretation, um, setting up control groups. So this gave us a fresh new perspective um, and gave us some very pleasant results, I would say. So we look forward to seeing um, what the results will be as we continue with this project. Yeah, and just to piggyback on what Crystal was saying, you know, it really does keep you honest when you know that um, you have a well-structured study and you have your controls and i think that was really the greatest value is that it instilled the discipline in sessi um, to go the distance rather than putting something out and you know not really thinking through all the scenarios and i really appreciated the way jeremy and simone and michael came to us and gave us that structure you know, the initial challenge was just looking at the client database and say, you know, how do we apply this? How do we um, create randomization? It, it's something that would have never come to mind for us. And, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, the chosen method, which was, you know, based on um, the last digit of the social security number, actually created, you know, a fairly even distribution across the groups. And so, you know, we were able to really see the impact of that encouragement. And, you know, sitting in the seat from the marketing side, um, I think it also really challenged us to push our um, technical capabilities. Um, the visual, I think it was so important for the customer experience and how we delivered these treatments in a meaningful way. And, you know, without the financial support um, from the subgrant from IPA, you know, we would not have had the resources to move forward and get the development. Um, we were able to, you know, get a contractor who developed graphs for us and animations. Um, you know, when you go in the portal and you've hit a milestone, we got these really cool animations and everybody was like, wow, this is gonna be great. And what we found was that, um, you know, customers were really confused because they think in terms of creditor payoff. And, you know, at the marketing group, we have a Facebook community that's just for our clients. And in the last year, we have not heard anybody say, hey, I just completed a milestone. But you always see people say, hey, I just paid off a creditor or I'm, you know, X dollars away from paying off my entire debt. And so I think just the simple treatment of the encouragement group um, really provided that motivation for those who were logging on and they could say, okay, you know, I'm this far away from my overall goal. One of the challenges the milestones presented um, from an implementation and customer experience side was that it really didn't correspond with the amount they were paying to SESI. It focused simply on the percent of debt to creditors. And a customer would look at that and say, well, you know, I've paid more to you than this. And then there was, um, I would say, more of an emphasis on having to explain 
the breakout between service fees to SESI and you know, what was going to the creditors because they weren't reflected in the milestones. And with you know, the encouragement group, with some very savvy customers, they would say, wait a minute, that looks a little low, um, but it really didn't kind of blow up into you know, a larger discussion around um, you know, dissatisfaction the way we sometimes saw with the milestone group. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, one of the other things that we have been working on at SESI is a customer app. And we were very fortunate that we were able to apply both the encouragement group and the milestone treatments that Jeremy showed you from our client dashboard into the main dashboard of the app. So we were able to deliver a consistent customer experience across multiple channels. And what we've learned from this experiment is that, you know, the simple encouragement is, you know, really what seems to resonate anecdotally a little bit better. And therefore, when we were looking at our project roadmap for our app this year, um, we are in the process of designing a badge and a reward system that, you know, really keys off of this principle of encouragement um, that we would not have tapped into, you know, if not for participation in this study. Okay. Um, thank you so much uh, for everybody to share the uh, the early findings from from this. And so, obviously, we get uh, get really excited about hearing the um, uh, when the when the study is final and we have even more findings um, to share. Um, so I think we can uh, move on to the question and, and answer uh, period now. Uh, let's see. Um, so the first question um, to actually each of you is really around uh, some of the surprises that you talked about, Jeremy. There seems to be some um, em emerging evidence. It's a little bit different than what we've learned in uh, in a lot of the academic literature that's already available. Uh, can you explain some of the some of those differences? What's going on there, and what you anticipate? Yeah, I, that's I, that's really. Something that's interesting to me. Um, so I, I'd say a couple of things. One is that there's often a disconnect between what we find to be successful in the lab or successful in a correlational sense, and then we take it to a randomized field trial uh, with all the difficulties of uh, doing things in the real world. Uh, and those findings just don't hold up, that there's, there's correlational effects, but there's not causal effects. So that might be something what's going on here as well with the, with the milestone reframing. But I think there's also challenges. So we try to do uh, things in a pretty light touch, uh, low implementation cost way. Uh, and as Jean uh, and Crystal pointed out, um, we, we weren't very successful in really reframing consumers' perceptions around tracking progress against the milestones uh, in particular. Right? So it would be more financially advantageous if they thought about it, the milestones rather than the creditors, but that's how they thought about it their entire life. And so with this really light touch intervention, it wasn't, it wasn't enough. Uh, to get them to reframe their beliefs around uh, milestones rather than creditors. And I think perhaps with some more uh, educational outreach, uh, we might have been more successful there, but then that, that entails a lot of additional costs on staff time to, to reach out and have those discussions. Uh, so maybe effects will be better from a high touch intervention, but it comes with higher costs. And so part of the, the lack of effects was certainly due to a client misunderstanding or, or not uh, a strong enough push to reframe perceptions uh, through the externally defined milestones rather than the progress metrics that clients are used to tracking, which is total debt and, uh, and, and creditors. Okay, uh, Jean, did you have something else to add? Um, just simply that, um, you know, we were very surprised. I know that I, was very excited by the concept of milestone and breaking things down into smaller, more achievable chunks. But as Jeremy said, you know, customers have been relating to creditors their you know whole financial lives, and they have very passionate views, as we see in our community, about particular creditors. Um, so you know, perhaps in the future, 
you know, the reframing takes on um, some aspect of marrying what their norms are to say we group you know, perhaps high interest creditors in a certain way. And the milestone becomes getting rid of the high interest creditors um, rather than, um, you know, a percentage of the debt. You know, thinking about it in that way for the future, you know, in a different study may prove more effective, but, um, you know, I was really surprised that um, the milestones did not resonate more with the customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that is um, that is a bit surprising. Um, so given that, what do you think, if you had known then what you know now, what might you have changed about the research design? Yeah, I, I will pick up exactly where Jean left off and, and we could um, think about doing more client outreach, more education around the milestones, um, but also to reframe it a bit more uh, into maybe discrete buckets or, or use creditor names, or label them in terms of uh, high interest or low interest uh, along the lines Jean was saying. Um, but then it becomes fundamentally a different intervention if it includes also a lot more consumer outreach and education that's more costly. Um, I think there are ways to probably do this more effectively. And I think it's important as Jean suggested to really try to meet the client where they are in terms of their mindset. Um, so we try to do it entirely with externally defined, externally defined milestones. Um, but there might be a much more effective method of perhaps creating individual individualized milestones with some interaction with the client to, to help determine what those milestones are, what's going to most resonate with them. Um, but that's a, that's a heavier lift, but it may, be, it may be more effective. And from our side, I think um, if we could go back and do it differently, um, we would have looked at how do we address the breakout between our fees and the milestone goals. I think we could have done a better job of implementing that. Um, but at the outset, we weren't really um, focused on that breakdown and how the customers would interpret that um, in terms of the fee exposure for SESI versus you know, what was being paid down you know, with the creditors. And I think if we had thought through a, a way to present that visually, um, in a very simple form, it may have created less confusion, but um, that's definitely something to think about for the future, uh, you know, when there is a service fee involved in addition to the payment to the creditor, because in the consumer's mind, I'm paying X and, you know, why isn't more of it going? Mm -hmm. you know, here? And that's something we didn't really think through probably as well as we should have. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one of the questions, I'm sorry, I, I would say I, I would agree with Dean. I think the challenge for us was a simplicity. Um, a, actually, the media that we're, we were using to um, text messaging, um, our customers tend to read it very quickly. So when we were adding the figures like the 3% and the, and the dollar amount, I think all of that created a lot of confusion for the customer. Um, and I think that's probably why the encouragement worked much better because mm -hmm. usually they're reading these messages very quickly um, and they just, want something that they don't have to think about. And when we added the debt reframing piece, where we put the 3% and the dollar amount, it really created a lot of confusion. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so one of the questions we've received um, on the participant list uh, on the webinar right now is, is around customer feedback and how much of customer feedback was used uh, as part of the study. So either in the, pro in the design at the beginning or um, uh, did anything change or update during the, the study or the research design? Uh, how, how much did customer feedback affect uh, what was actually planned and executed? Uh, so certainly in the, in the structuring of the study, I think, I think these types of collaborations work best when there's a lot of discussion at the outset between the research team and the implementing partner. So, so Simone uh, and I talked a lot with Jean and Crystal about what uh, clients, uh, their expertise and how clients respond and what they think about. And so there's a lot of client insights that were embedded into the design of the study at the outset. Uh, as we mentioned, we didn't, don't think we did it uh, the best we possibly could have, which is always the, the case in the first time you run an intervention. Um, so there was a lot of, of customer insights that they had built up throughout the, the course of their, their careers and working with DMP clients that we baked into the intervention. Um, 
but once we we set the intervention in motion uh, as researchers we really we really don't like to change it so we kept things sort of sort of constant uh, to really tease out the effects of what the intervention actually were uh, so we didn't dynamically change the messaging uh, based on client feedback throughout the course of the study um, but those insights we tried to bake in at the outset yeah, and I think that, um, you know, as I mentioned, my app project was running kind of simultaneously. So the um, feedback and the learnings about simple encouragement, um, that is being baked into future projects. But, um, you know, we definitely stayed the course. Um, we had to work with our customer care team to help them better understand how to explain the variances um, that you know they were receiving calls about and you know that was um you know something that was difficult because while we had the visual in the client portal the back end customer care piece did not contain those visuals so our was really flying blind and you know it was um a challenge for us that i think if we were to go back again um, that's something else we do differently is making sure our team can see on the back end what everyone is seeing on the front end. Um, the two systems, you know, are um, are different and, you know, that was a little bit overlooked. Um, one thing that I thought was just very interesting is that we have our client community, but in the year that this has been running, you know, no one's kind of outed the test cells. Um, and that was a concern that we had because um, we talked through, you know, all the ways we could keep the test cells, um, you know, discreet and make sure no client knew that they were getting a different treatment than someone else. And the Facebook community seemed like the high risk area. Um, but it was quite interesting that in, you know, all that time, no one ever kind of found out um, that they had anything different from anyone else. So, you know, I think that that was something that actually worked quite well. <laughs> mm. And uh, so you'd mentioned uh, during the presentation that this was one of your first forays into this type of rigorous research. Um, what would you recommend for other practitioners uh, who want to incorporate this type of, of, of research into it? Um, whether it be um, through recommendations for implementation or ways of thinking about it or communication? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I think this was a fabulous experience and it's been great working with the USC team and the IPA team. And so, you know, if anyone else um, has an opportunity to get involved, I would highly recommend that. Um, but I think that what I would do differently in the implementation is probably grab a few of our employees who are further downstream that are going to have the actual interaction. Um, when you have meetings and the design level all happens, you know, with the directors, there's a lot of stuff that gets overlooked um, for the day to day implementation. And I think there's a lot of valuable feedback that we probably missed as a team on SESI's side by not having more of our counselors, you know, who would have had the day to day interaction. Uh, they probably would have raised their hands and said, hey, I won't be able to see that graph. You know, what can you do for me? And so, um, I would say to others, you know, take advantage, get involved, but um, before you go to implementation, um, make sure you have feedback from, you know, all levels of your organization. And this is Chris, so I would, I would piggyback off of what Jean said, um, because something as simple as the colors that we use in the graphic, we did not realize would throw customers off and some of the representatives from our agency were like, were like why would you use these colors? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we should have included um, some of the other reps just, just to get a better idea of what a customer, or how a customer would perceive that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Would, just um, as sorry, yeah, yep. just also echo uh, what both Jean and Costa were saying that, that organizations don't have to go this alone, that there are uh, lots of researchers so the organizations are really well versed in their own client base and operations but but uh, uh, researchers uh, like the USC team and, and those that have connections to IPA are are well versed in creating uh, creating randomized controlled trials and in behavioral science and so combining insights from both uh, walks of life I think often creates the best 
intervention. So it gives the interventions the best chance to success. And so I really hope to see uh, more of the types of collaborations that, that SESI, USC, and IPA had. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, please reach out to IPA, reach out to me, uh, and always happy to discuss with potential implementing partners. Great, and just as a reminder to the participants on the phone, uh, you can submit questions on the, the Q&A uh, box at the, the, on the screen itself. Um, but I do have one more question for everybody around um, certainly what's in the news these days around the COVID-19 response. Um, and I'd like to get some of your ideas about how uh, some of the behavioral messaging can, can help um, with, with um, loan repayment now. We anticipate that there are gonna be quite some, some changes or perhaps shocks to the system. Uh, and what are you, what are you thinking about in terms of the response? Well, yeah, I, I think, oh, go, go ahead, Jane. Um, you know, the industry, the credit counseling industry is um, already seeing effects of clients who have become suddenly unemployed or reduced income. And so they're looking to us for leadership and for guidance on what they can do. And I know it's been a top priority in our organization over the last week to compile resources to set up a separate counseling line and to be able to encourage people to understand what their options are. Um, and then on the other side, you know, um, and Crystal can speak more to this, there have been efforts at the industry level, level to um, you know, push the creditors to um, be more forgiving as we move through this as a nation. And I think over time, um, what's gonna happen is that um, consumers who may not have been derailed are going to be derailed. And so it's up to us to come up with creative solutions um, to connect them with education and resources to encourage them and guide them through. Yeah, yes, um, just as, go, go ahead. ahead, I'm sorry, Jeremy. No, just, just as Jean stated, um, we have been reaching out um, as a trade association to creditors to see what they're going to provide as far as assistance to consumers. But we have noticed um, quite a bit of communication coming from consumers, um, way more than normal. We're getting phone calls. People are looking for answers. So this is an opportunity for us um, as an agency to um, build better rapport with our customers, provide better service, and uh, hopefully this will um, help with the study in the future um, because when they hear from us, they'll be more willing to listen. So relationship building is gonna be a very important part of this as, to go, as going forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll build off uh, Crystal's, Crystal's good point. Um, so there, there are things that behavioral interventions can't do, right? It's not gonna solve all problems. And we should be cognizant of what we might ex expect effect sizes to be. It's, this is not gonna help someone who has zero income and can't pay uh, any debts. Right? But, but the, the COVID situation is also creating a lot of uncertainty uh, and uh, nervousness as well. And so um, it may actually be larger effects uh, in an uncertain environment when you help Consumers really see they're making progress towards one of their most important goals, uh, which is getting out of debt. Uh, and so if they continually to reprise them or remind them that, you know, they're making progress along this, this critical life goal that's important to their economic security, uh, that might help uh, even more in, a, in an uncertain environment. And it'd be interesting to see what happens uh, as we go forward. Uh, sort of, we're sort of well positioned in the study to, to tack effects uh, over time and look and see if there's discrete changes uh, with the onset of the crisis. Okay, uh, we have one, I think, final question uh, from, from the participants um, asking about the impact on credit score. And so it's sort of a two-part question. If you've thought about providing clients with encouragement uh, in terms of good repayment um, by how this would affect their credit score. Uh, and the second part is around client involvement with SESI and, and having any, uh, what impact does it have, I think, on their credit score, uh, whether it's positive or negative. Well, our trade association, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I know that our trade association has been reaching out and um, talking with the OCC about getting some um, assistance with maybe a forbearance period. Um, so it would not hopefully impact the credit score um, because of the situation. 
Um, but yes, we have um, thought about communicating to the consumer the importance. Um, the challenge you have there is um, making sure that we still sound somewhat compassionate. Um, I think we sent out a communication about um, one of our programs that we were offering and some consumers um, were concerned that we were more concerned about them making a payment and less concerned about their situation. So I think the challenge is going to be how we word those communications um, and hopefully um, we're able to get that um, forbearance period and not have a huge implementation on their credit score. Yeah, I, I like the idea of um, trying to help improve motivation by reframing things in terms of improved credit scores. But, but the challenge is it, it's hard. It's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen to credit scores. Since this is not something to control, and we don't even know all the inputs since the credit scoring models are proprietary. Um, maybe we could, we could maybe talk about average effects. Um, I think particularly uh, when a client joins DMP, they often take a, a credit score ding um, because they're in a structured repayment program. Uh, and so the goal is not for a, a, to quickly improve their credit score. The goal is really to help get them out of debt. Uh, and so I, in this context, I think we wanted to, to really focus them on, on the goal that they signed up for, which is getting out of debt. Um, but there may be some ancillary benefits from from pointing out that credit scores are likely going to improve once you once you pay off all these debts and, and exit, exit the, uh, the restructured agreements. Okay, great. Um, so we're just about at time. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much for, for everybody's um, input and, and time today. It was, I think, a really interesting discussion. Um, realize this is all preliminary and so we look forward to uh, hearing all the final results and uh, seeing how, how how things will change in the final data collection. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Thanks. Bye.